interviewing the leading private equity executives and unlocking the secrets of success. Welcome to the Private Equity Podcast with Alex Rawlings. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Private Equity Podcast. Joining us today is Jeff Gonyo, the founder and managing director of Geneva Glen Capital. Welcome, and thank you very much for sharing your insights with us today, Jeff. Great to be here, Alex. Appreciate you inviting me. No, my pleasure. So as is customary, Jeff, if you could give us a 60 to 90 second breakdown of you, please. Happy to. So I've been a private equity investor for 32 years and feel like a, a veteran, been doing this for a long time. Love this business. I have a passion for it. I want to keep doing it as long as I'm mentally and physically able to do so. It's it's an awesome, it's an awesome uh, business. As they say, do what you love. And it doesn't feel like work to me. Some days it does. We have things don't go according to plan, but for the most part, uh, it's it's really it's have fun, make money. So um, that's why I've done. I started my firm 14 years ago after a career at two larger private equity firms in the Chicago area, GTCR, Winpoint Partners, and been blessed to work with two great individuals since 2010, uh, Adam Schechter and Tom Molner. We uh, have really good chemistry working together, and we pursue companies with lower middle market companies, which is a space we like, and that's usually below 100 million enterprise value, where we can add value significantly by bringing in operating executives who have scaled much larger businesses along with domain expertise. So in a nutshell, that's that's our strategy, what we do. And we've invested in seven platform companies to date. Thank you very much for that. What's one mistake that you see private equity firms or portfolio companies making and what actions would you suggest to correct them? Sure, sure. I, I think the, the key thing when we're seeing today is companies that private equity firms are focused on more on financial engineering over, you know, over leveraging businesses. We typically go in pretty conservatively with one part debt, one part equity. And that way we all sleep better at night. Uh, the, the company's not too tightly wound from a covenant perspective. And that's very true today with rising interest rates. We may sacrifice a little bit of returns, but we all, you know, we all have this more breathing room and, and comfort. So we focus more on organic growth versus just trying to find the last dollar of financial uh, financial leverage to to uh, generate a higher return. Um, we have a we're not a traditional syndicated fund, so we don't have to go out and fundraise every three or four years. Our deals are our deal by deal equity in, investments. So we have a, a handful of investors that we've worked with. And that gives us the flexibility that we can be a little bit longer term patient capital. We're not on the fundraising treadmill where we have to go raise a fund every three or four years and perpetually go, you know, it's, it's rinse, uh, it's, it's lather, rinse, repeat, you know, again and again, where you raise a fund, you deploy it, and then you have to start selling companies. So having that flexibility gives us the, you know, our investors understand that we may take a little bit lower return more conservative capital structure. And then the value creation is really on all growing the earnings of the business, usually with these operating executives I mentioned earlier. That's interesting. So what led you to go down that route of deal by deal, independent sponsor type uh, process rather than, you know, your typical uh, blind fund pool capital basis? Yeah, I, that's, that's the world I came from where we raised pools of capital and it's it just gives us a lot more flexibility. So we can we can work with a relatively small business, say 3 million of EBITDA up to about 20 million of EBITDA. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have that flexibility. We would otherwise we'd have to construct a portfolio where we had, you know, 10 similarly sized transactions and it becomes very rigid in that regard. And also we'd be always preoccupied of having to raise that next fund. If we don't raise the next fund, then we're out of business. We don't have capital anymore. Much, much more enjoy having the flexibility to do smaller and larger deals in different industries too. The world's changed. I mean, funds are become more specialists in certain industries, whether it's healthcare or consumer. I like having the generalist approach still 
as long as we have that strong angle with that operating executive who really has a domain expertise that that has you know really specialized insight to a particular industry as well as they have a network of people that we can help build out that team within that company and jumping back to the, the independent sponsor right does that give you i assume it gives you some benefits to obviously you mentioned with the the longer hold periods more flexibility on invested capital what what are some of the drawbacks from that perspective do you have to get kind of equivalent of sign off every time you do a deal um does it slow down the process a little bit if you haven't got kind of the green light or do you have how, how does how does that kind of drawbacks and benefits work for you that's a great that's a great question alex and <clears throat> the reality is within larger private equity firms they may have 10 partners and they all have to sign off on the deal. They all have to approve it. So although they can call the capital from a limited partners, there's always internal, uh, uh, you know, natural discussion or maybe some controversy, whether they want to invest in that business or not. What we do is we move it simultaneously and go raise the capital while we're shoring up the opportunity, getting it signed up under letter of intent. And we're able to move very quickly and, that hasn't that hasn't been an issue with us. The whole independent sponsor market is is blossomed in the last oh last 10, 15 years. It used to be the Wild West. It still is to some degree, because anybody can put out a shingle and say I'm an independent sponsor. But the number of firms that really have experienced private equity professionals that have worked together for a long time that could easily go out and raise a fund, but they choose not to, that's a relatively small subset. So we have very strong relationships with investors that like our model. They get to look at each opportunity and decide whether they want to be in it or not. Otherwise, if they're in a the blind pool, then they have, you know, they really have to commit for the next, you know, that entire fund, which would be 10 deals, regardless mm -hmm. of how well those deals work out on the front end. Okay. Okay. And during that conversation as well, you mentioned about your investment strategy. You, you know, looked on the website, very clear healthcare, business services, consumer products, manufacturing, distribution. And then you've got a very clear message of no retail tech, uh, restaurants, and a few other bits. What made you decide on those industries as, as your area of focus? Part of its experience, you know, I've done a number of healthcare deals in my career, healthcare, multi-site healthcare services. That's a theme we like where we can grow through acquisition. We can buy up sequentially a number of, of uh, providers. We can also do de novos, new startups, whether it's physical therapy, home healthcare. That's, that's worked well for us. So that's a common theme, not only within um, healthcare, but other services. For instance, we bought a a uh, franchisee of Sola Salon Suites. So these are okay. uh, these are where independent hairstylists would practice their profession. They'd rent space from us. We have 20 to 40 individual bays or suites within one space within typically strip mall. And that industry is really expanding very rapidly. In this case, we partnered with a couple of very experienced franchising executives and we bought 42 locations of Sola Salon Suites in Pennsylvania and Tennessee. We'll build those out. Uh, we'll also, we're also looking at making acquisitions of other franchisees that want to retire, essentially. So it's a combination of de novo growth as well as doing, uh, as well as doing some acquisitions. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, and you, you also mentioned about your operating executives and partnering with those. Now, this is something I've seen done well and incredibly not so well, uh, for better term of phrase. What results have you had on that basis and how have you kind of driven your you know, investment strategy and built that in through that operating executive model and maybe give us a bit of an explanation of also your, your interpretation of your, uh, your ex operating executive model? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Alex. If you look at every private equity firm, probably it's a slightly different definition of what an operating partner is. For us, we don't have full-time operating partners that are part of our firm that you would see on our website, but rather we tailor it specifically to a, a uh, portfolio company. So usually what happens is we meet an operating executive. They've been, they've been fairly successful. They've ran at least a $150 million P&L um, probably up to a billion dollar PL. 
And they've they had some success in the corporate world. They may even done a private equity deal or two before, and they've seen that result. That's even better if they've been through, involved in private equity deal. And we would we would um, really understand what's their thesis. You know, what's their um, their focus? And we're very particular. We want executives who want to go back to an industry they know. They have domain expertise. As I said earlier, either they have contacts or they just have the know-how, the nuances. Mm-hmm. We, we bought a home healthcare business. Uh, I met an executive at uh, the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference, which is the big um, industry conference in San Francisco every January. Met a very experienced home healthcare executive, he had about $250 million PL. He was getting to the stage in his career where he didn't want to be in the front lines, but really wanted to coach and sort of advise. So we worked out a situation where he became chairman of a business, which he actually found, took, about, took us a couple of years actually to find it. Um, but it was a deal that, you know, he just called them up and it was a contact from the past. And he was able, we were able to strike up a relationship with them and buy this business from two owners that were former accountants. And they had done a nice job with this business. It was a number two player in the Philadelphia market about a $50 million business called Southeastern Home Health Services. But Rick really had a, he could immediately see where there was opportunities to, to grow that business, um, you know, strengthen their management team, stay compliant. That's, that's a huge, that's a huge thing within um, the healthcare sector, especially home health, because it's primarily government reimbursed. So take all those steps. And he had a, he had a playbook essentially. And he was successful over the course of five years. We, we, we tripled the earnings of the business. We never did an acquisition. We tried to, but we never could get one done. And we ended up selling that company last year to a, a much larger industry player. And that was like an eight times return on our investment, which um, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of. We're happy with that. They don't all work out that way, but this would be a, a prime example. And then we sold that business last year. We ended up buying another one it's kind of at that same inflection point. It's this company in the, the Western part of the U S called Envision Home Health. And we're, we're employing that same playbook there where Rick is, we're building out the team. Uh, we're making incremental improvements and helping grow that business. So that's love that story because it's, that's one where we've done it twice now with the same executive. So, um, you know, Rick's active chairman, he spends about half his time with that business the rest of the time he's retired, he lives in a nice uh, coastal beach area um, in the Southeast US. And so that's worked well, that's worked well for him. And we love to do more of those. The, tr- the trouble, the not the trouble, but the challenge is finding operating executives who really fit. There's a variety of filters, right? You have to have ones that have had a successful track record in an industry that we understand, or it's not too like technology, we're not going to invest in tech companies just because it's 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 very specialized knowledge. Healthcare is specialized too, but we feel like we know enough there. So um, you know, find those executives with domain expertise, trackers, track record of success, and then that that final ingredient, which is really important, is that entrepreneurial energy, where you know they're willing to roll up their sleeves, get involved, um, co-invest with us, something meaningful to them, and they don't look at as really a job, but, but it's, it's a, an endeavor, a bigger endeavor. We like to think of them, they're buying the business. The executive is buying the business and we're helping essentially uh, be their financial sponsor. So when they have that mindset, it's very entrepreneurial that, that can work, that can work great. And uh, we haven't, we haven't had much turnover at all. It's, it's, it's worked well and we've consistently applied this strategy. Okay. Sorry to interrupt here, just a quick note to highlight our new sponsor, Grata. The private equity market is rapidly shifting to a data-driven, proprietary deal sourcing standard. Grata provides the window into over 7 million middle market private companies. Contact Grata so you can access the market first. Request a demo at www.grata.com. Now back to the podcast. And so I know quite a few firms that have done this or try to do this, but don't particularly do it very well. In essence, you're utilizing people's networks to deal source and then bringing them in on the uh, uh, some level on the deal in, in simplicity from that perspective. What 
and we spoke a little bit on this prior to uh, to going live on the podcast. How many people do you speak to on a yearly basis? Just give us some figures on that because I think there's a little bit of an expectation that you can speak to two or three executives and you end up with one. And uh, and I know that that's not the case. And based on what you've shared with me, that's definitely not the case. So just give us a bit of a perspective of how you're deploying this and the amount of you know hard work and effort that has to go into to get you know some of these deals. And you know you've got two two deals off one executive there, which is which is great. Absolutely. We probably speak to about 300 executives a year, and that may seem daunting, but the reality is we the world's changed a lot, and the knowledge of private equity is, has blossomed. Most, most executives now know what private, private equity is. Mm -hmm. uh, back when I started in this business, I'll give me a, give me an example. I uh, was at uh, my first firm, GTCR, and when we were very thesis driven, look, looking at particularly fragmented industries that could consolidate, you could grow through acquisition. So I um, heard about an executive in the office equipment dealership industry. Uh, his name is Tom Johnson. And he was the number two executive at the two largest companies in the industry. He was actually let go of his last business. And this is before the internet, this is early 90s. Um, somehow I got his phone number, tracked him down. At first, he didn't know who I was. He thought I was a stockbroker or, or you know, who, who are you? What is what is private equity or venture capital for that matter back then? And, um, you know, I convinced him to come to Chicago, meet with uh, myself and my, my partners, my bosses at the time. And uh, he was just a very down to earth uh, guy from Florida, very low key, went to Harvard Business School, but you wouldn't know it meeting him. And uh, he was a delight to work with. And what I found was he, he'd be a prototypical executive because he, I went to, to get to know him better, I went to a trade show where all these office equipment dealers were selling or, or, or um, meeting an industry conference. And everybody would come up to Tom and they just knew him. And he, I could just tell right away that this guy is a Pied Piper. People want to work with Tom. He had made dozens and dozens of acquisitions and ended up um, partnering with Tom. We bought the first business, eight million in revenues. We ended up making hundred acquisitions over 13 years. Company went, uh, went public about six years in, and then we sold to Xerox uh, for 1.5 billion. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's a great example. That would be, that's the perfect, a uh, situation where you have the executive, the executive in the industry, you work with them, It'd be much more competitive to get somebody like Tom today because the back to my earlier point, the the knowledge of private equity is really blossomed. So actually, we get a lot of resumes in, and some of those we react to, some don't. But it's it's really hard to tell. We meet a lot of operating executives, and they're like, well. I, I think I could run pretty much anything, you know, a lot of basic manufacturing business or something like that. I'm sure you get that when you're doing your search work as well. And we really value the domain expertise. Again, one for just, you know, critical know-how uh, knowledge, but also just network of people, people that they can bring in. The example with Rick, I mentioned earlier, um, our home healthcare executive, we were able to, you know, add six people to the C-suite over the course of that investment and really upgraded all those functions or created new functions that didn't exist before. So um, that's what we value. It's know-how, it's uh, industry knowledge, and it's that entrepreneurial energy or kind of fire in the belly. Like they really want, they're, they're hungry, they're eager, they want to create wealth for themselves. They may have had a taste of it before, but they still have that eagerness. So that's, um, that's a tight filter. So those 300 people, we probably end up, we can only work with a handful at one time. Otherwise we're spread too thin. Of course. Then um, it's, it's a combination being reactive to about the 850 deals that we see a year that come through the intermediary or the investment banker or broker network. But we also like to be very proactive and try to find like we did with Southeastern situations that aren't really on the market or maybe they're thinking about being on the market. And we, we have that luxury of, a more negotiated uh, sale with them or purchase. And um, that's, that's a perfect, perfect situation, but we're not afraid to participate in auctions. It's just that we just really need a strong, you know, that strong angle with that executive and usually we'll rise to the top. Um, if we have that strong angle, because the owner says, okay, here's, these people are more than just capital. Mm -hmm. um, they all sound alike. Their websites sound the same. 
What's really different about them? The difference really comes with the operating executive. So the typical seller for us would be somebody who is still, they, they've had success. They don't want to retire. They don't want to leave, but they're looking for help. They're looking for help and they're prepared to roll over anywhere from 20 to 49% ownership post deal. That's the perfect situation for us. No, it makes, makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people underestimate the level of work that needs to go in for these opportunities. And, and you mentioned something there about, uh, you know, using, utilizing intermediaries, which no doubt investment banks and go down auction processes. We also mentioned proprietary deal flow, um, which is particularly difficult. It's a very competitive landscape. Private equity is becoming a more normal practice for companies to exit to. And, um, you know, especially post COVID and as we go into, you know, more uncertain times, uh, as we end 2022, there's going to be a lot of founder, business owners, uh, business leaders that are finally going, you know, I've just gone through COVID, that was bad enough, and now we're going again, uh, I might want to exit here and change. How are you, what what strategies do you use to drive proprietary deal flow? Um, because I think it's, it can be seen like a bit of a unicorn, a bit of a myth in the industry, which, you know, I know, I know for sure it's certainly not. That's a that's a great question. The, the ideal would be the operating executive would make the calls. Mm -hmm. We would do all the research. We'd come up with that target list, but they would actually do the calling. And that's that's again that's another, another very tight filter because unless the executive worked in sales or business development, yeah. you know, if they're purely operators or they're financial CFO types that you know became this became more operators. They're probably not wired that way to do that. But in reality is these business owners, they're interested in doing something, but it's like the, the sharks are, are swimming. You know, the Wall Street types are calling me. I'm going on their website. These guys are all Ivy League, you know, type, type people. And they're intimidated by that. You know, it's like the Wall Street sharks. So, um, but when an operator calls, particularly if it's somebody who worked at a company that's very recognizable, They'll market. take the call yeah. more often. And plus, the rapport starts very quickly because they may know somebody in common. They can speak the same language. That's ideal for us. But again, that, that's part of that filter process is finding those executives who are willing to make calls and have all those other attributes. It's a tall order to, um, you know, to line all those things up. No, it can be, definitely can be. And it's obviously building that relationship with that individual as the operating executive and them supporting you and putting themselves in their position, you know, which you know, there's only a certain amount of people that are, are prepared to make that proactive outreach and you know have those conversations and, and discussions. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, what's uh, curious, Jeff, you, know, you talk about operating executives. What kind of three attributes do you believe make a top performer? within the portfolio world and uh, portfolio executives? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, I First of all, I, the executives that in private equity that makes sense are ones that think like investors. They're always thinking about ROI. What is this? They kind of know the financial model. They know like, oh, if I invest, if I invest in capital expenditures to build this, this piece of equipment, it's going to have a payback and two years or less. Um, they can look at accretive acquisitions and figure out how can I integrate this business? Mm -hmm. So they really think like the investors and they, they actually have that financial model, which we spend a lot of time with them upfront before we close in the deal to say, here's all the value drivers, here's the sensitivities, here's what you can do. So they they get that. And that's that takes a little bit of a, an education, particularly when you have some debt and you've got to pay down the debt, but sort of how do we, how do we make money in a buyout? I think it's so critical that they really understand that. So that's where I credit if we if we if we back an executive who's already done private equity, that's really helpful. Um, the second thing is love executives who um, are more less salesy and more kind of like they fret the details, they worry about the downside, under promise over deliver. You know, it's a it's a somewhat of a trite phrase, but it's very true. I mean, ones that not sandbagging a budget, but you know, but they they always figure out a way to to make their plan. They don't give us some you know very grandiose plan that 
you know, we know is unlikely to happen, but rather they're very focused on just under promise over deliver. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the third thing is they're really good assessors of talent of people that they can, they can add to the team to build out in that C-suite. So they need strong lieutenants in all the functional areas, typically, you know, sales and marketing, finance, ops. Um, and that's, you know, people that have that, they can sell people to join them, maybe from their network, but also they're, um, they're good assessors of talent to know this person is going to fit or not fit. And hopefully we don't have, it's very disruptive when you have to make a change at that C-suite level because we're typically targeting a five-year hold. So then we have to start over again. We have to find someone else. So, so the hit rate, the hit rate's got to be, it's got to be very high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And well, obviously testament is the, to the industry of being difficult, securing good executives and bringing them on board. And then when you get that wrong, it's uh, obviously a uh, costly process because of the time that you lose. You know, if you're running on, as you mentioned, those five year cycle times, then, you know, you could equally be into year one of that five, and then you have to make the change. And that may take you six months potentially to, to everything to bed in. And then, you know, you're, you're already, uh, a considerable amount of way through that five years and it just shortens the time horizon to get things right so uh absolutely so what, what do you love about private equity and what do you just like about it jeff i love i love the thrill of like finding an opportunity a company and then pairing that with an operating executive that's that's paramount you know sort of like building something creating something I'm not a venture capital investor. I, I don't like startups; too risky for me. But, but I feel like it's a little bit of creating something, mirroring that executive talent and the operating executive. So that's really what I like is 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 matching those two things up. Good companies, great executives, putting those together. Um, that's that's probably what I like the most. It sort of keeps me keeps me engaged and seeing all different types of businesses over doing this for 32 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the things I don't like about it are. You know, it sometimes it can be it can be a particularly when you, a grind on a deal and you're trying to you know you work on something for a year and it doesn't happen or blows up or there's a surprise or due diligence doesn't check out. I mean, you have to have a lot of resilience as a private equity investor to do this for a living because um, invariably, and as an independent sponsor, it's probably even tougher because you don't you know you're much smaller team and the highs and lows become more magnified. Um, as a result. So it's sort of that, that grind to get something over the finish line. And that's why it's always a sigh, you know, a, uh, a sigh of relief, you know, when you get something closed and there's always something at the last minute that comes up, that's just the deal business. And, you know, I think that's where sometimes it's interesting, like operators, they look at us as private equity guys and say, I want to do what you guys do. Well, it's, it's, you know, you're going to have to take, you're going to have to be very emotionally resilient to, to deal with that and you know the ups and downs and work on something for a year and you have nothing to show for it so so um i don't really like that part but i've sort of i've, I've learned how to like cope with that and sort of and it not not expect it to happen but you know when it does happen but that's when i tell people about what i do for a living sort of what's the uh the things i really like about it. it's building businesses creating businesses you know building talent around companies and then uh, just deal with the vagaries, but but nothing else I'd rather do for a living. Um, the only thing, other thing, is just the publicity of the villainization of private equity. As look back to uh, Michael Douglas, the actor in Wall Street, you know, greed is good. That quote, and that still seems to stick, at least in politics here in the U.S. You know, everybody loves a bad guy to pick on, and politicians tend to do that. But I think once you you educate people in terms of we are job creators. I mean, there's people that have been um, more vocal in our industry lately that sort of defending it. Otherwise, I felt like over the last several decades, nobody really stands up for the private equity guys. It's always we're just villains and and uh, you know company destroyers. Certainly, that's the case. Back to the point about too much leverage. Toys R Us is always an example. People uh, toss out and it was over leveraged and uh, you know a difficult. Uh, model with the internet uh, changing retail landscape. So, so anyway, it's just, it's just, I don't really care for that, but again, I, I, I love to explain to people that aren't familiar with private equity in terms of what it really is. And they usually figure out that, Hey, we are, 
we're not such bad guys after all. Absolutely. I think there's, yeah, you know, we can, there's, there's good and the bad is in every industry and, and, and a lot of industries get a bad rap. I think there's a lot more private equity can do um, to actually tell the story of what's gone on and what's happened because, I think the reason that that Toys R Us falls so popular, and we've spoken about in the podcast previously, is it's something that everybody knows. And if Starbucks was obviously it's public listed, but Starbucks decided to be private equity backed and was taken, then and that went under, that would be you know phenomenal. But if equally, if private equity took over a company, I can't think of a large retail business off my head um, that private equity have done a deal in and grown that significantly, you will never hear about that. Um, so it's kind of like you know bad news travels a lot quicker than certainly than good. But I think there's a little bit more that private equity can do to open the communication levels and maybe remove a little bit of the secrecy. Uh, around you know what we do and how it operates and you know well, we can't talk about you know you, you mentioned earlier about your your AX return you know I've got firms that couldn't even talk about things like that and I'm like why and they're like oh well we just can't and I'm like yes you can you can have conversations about what's been done and and the and the record that's been done so the you know part of hopefully um, will uh, this podcast will will help with that so Jeff what are your influences? What do you read? What do you watch? What do you listen? What would you point other listeners to to, to follow and, and check out? Uh, that's that's a good question. I think my influences. I'll go. I'll just go back. The, the when I first started in this business, one thing. It's very old book. Uh, two books actually. Dale Carnegie: How to Win Friends, Influence People, Classic. and How to Stop uh, Start Start Living and Stop Worrying. You know, kind of those two were great influential books when I started because, um, like I said, this business can be stressful and you got to put manage that stress. Also, you've got to build relationships with people quickly. And and um, that was that was probably my most influential book I read younger these days. Um, you know, that, the beauty today is with podcasts. I don't have anybody particular that I enjoy, but it's a great thing when I spend time driving back and forth to my I have a house in Wisconsin, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and then Glenview, Illinois. And that's about an hour and 15 minute trip. Podcasts are great for that or catching up. And I just find myself, you know, not reading newspapers as much anymore. It's just attention span. And if you have to read it on a computer, it's just not the same as reading through. I guess I'm just old. I love, I loved reading through the Wall Street Journal page by page. My, my father still does that. But uh, I feel like I miss out a little bit because it's just too much, uh, there's too much just information overload when you're reading something on the computer, you get distracted too easily. So oh, there's anyway. too much stuff popping up. There's what's exactly. your emails, LinkedIn messages, or well, certainly for us anyway, LinkedIn messages and whatever else. So yeah, I, uh, I agree with that. How does anybody best reach out to you, Jeff? What's the best way for them to, uh, to get in touch should they wish to do so? My contact information's on the website. So genevaglencapital.com. Perfect. Well, we'll put that all in the show notes. And thank you very much for joining us, Jeff. Really appreciate your insight. Leave lots of value here. Independent sponsor discussions, utilizing operating executives to drive proprietary deal flow and everything in between. So thank you very much for sharing everything you have done today. My pleasure. Happy holidays. Absolutely. And as always, thank you very much for those joining us. And of course, should you ever need support with either your private equity professionals or portfolio executive hiring across Europe and North America, please do reach out to us at Real Selection. But till the next time, keep smashing it. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Private Equity Podcast on www.raw-selection.com.